And today, uh, as I've said before, we're going to be looking at um, some of the defects that can arise during the injection molding of plastic components. Um, and as usual, uh, before we start talking about this topic in particular, I'd like to go through some of the key points of the last uh, lecture. So in the last lecture, we talked about the injection molding process. And we've said that in general, uh, an injection molding system or equipment is comp composed of three uh, functional uh, units. The first unit is uh, the injection unit that it's normally composed of the injection cylinder where we have our uh, screw and the driving unit that controls the rotation and also the linear displacement of uh, the screw to allow for the injection of uh, the molten plastic. We also have normally a hopper that contains the polymer or the plastic in the solid state and allows uh, the right volume of material that we want to inject to be dispensed into the injection cylinder where it will then uh, be melted. The other functional unit normally present in an injection molding equipment is the mold itself. There is composed of two parts, one that is fixed and another one that is um, uh, movable. And this allows for the opening and closing of the mold for the injection of the parts, but also to be able to remove the parts from the molds after the, the, the material is completely solidified. And also uh, a very important uh, unit in terms of the injection molding system is the actual uh, clamping mechanism. And the clamping mechanism is uh, important uh, in order to ensure that we have the right forces in order to close the mold. And the size dimensions of these clamping units normally depends on the volume or the size of the part that you are uh, injecting. So the higher, so the, the higher the volume of the part, the larger the part that you're normally injecting, the higher will be the force required to ensure that uh, the mold is properly closed and that uh, the injection molding can be carried out properly. So these are the three functional units that you need to know that are normally present in uh, a commercial injection molding system. <clears throat> We've also said that in terms of the injection process that these can be normally divided into uh, four stages or uh, four um, steps. The first one is the plastification. And what happens during uh, the plastification uh, stage? At this stage, normally what you have is the dispensing of the solid material, generally in the form of uh, pellets or granules, into the injection barrel. Inside the injection barrel, what will happen is by setting the melting temperature inside the injection barrel just below the melting temperature of the plastic that you're using, you're gonna promote the melting of your uh, material. This is done not just by um, increasing uh, the temperature inside the injection barrel, but also by activating the rotational movement of the screw. So this promotes the melting of the material, but also a more homogeneous uh, melting and mixing of the material that it's previously in the solid state. Once the material is melted, then we move into the second stage. That is the injection of the molten material into the cavity of the mold. And this is done by the rotational movement of the screw combined with the linear displacement of the screw. And this will allow us to force the molten metal, uh, sorry, the molten polymer through the injection nozzle and into the cavity of uh, the mold. Once the material is inside the cavity of the mold, it will start uh, solidifying. And as we've discussed 
in the previous lecture. The solidification of polymers, similar to what happens with metals, normally leads uh, to uh, shrinkage, or in other words, can originate the volumetric contraction of the material as it solidifies and as it forms its crystalline structures. When this happens during the solidification, it's normal that some gaps are formed inside the cavity of the mold. So in order to uh, compensate for that volumetric shrinkage and to ensure that the entirety cavity of the mold is filled in with uh, material, and as a consequence to ensure that we obtain parts that are geometrically and dimensionally accurate, we need very often to uh, go through a packing uh, stage. And this packing stage generally involves the increase of the injection pressure that will allow us to inject more material to compensate for the gaps that are left because of the contraction of the material. It's important that you know that normally this uh, packing or holding pressure is normally much higher than the injection pressure. And this happens because we already have material that it's solidified or it's solidifying inside um, the cavity of the mold and therefore the injection of more material will require much higher pressures in order uh, to ensure that the material can reach those gaps that are left inside the cavity of the molds. Once those uh, gaps that are originated because of the shrinkage of the material are completely uh, filled and the material is solidified, then we have the demold or injection stage. At this stage, uh, two things happen. The first one is the relief of the pressure, uh, the, the, the packing pressure. And this is uh, originated by uh, the movement of uh, the screw to its original uh, position. And then the mold is opened and the mechanical ejectors that are normally placed in the cavity of the mold will force the ejection of the parts and uh, the part can then be uh, retrieved. After this, the mold is closed again. A new volume of material is dispensed into injection cylinder. The material is melted and again injected into uh, the part. So the cycle restarts again. So it's important that you know these four stages in terms of the injection cycle and what happens in each one of these uh, stages. <clears throat> in terms of uh, the materials and the structures of the, of the materials that are, are formed and similar to what happens with uh, metals, uh, the structure of these materials and in particular the, the it's, it's crystalline forms it's uh, extremely important in terms of the defects that can be originated but also in terms of um, the process parameters that we normally set during the injection of uh, plastic components so the crystallinity has a significant impact in this uh, injection molding process and has a particular impact in terms of the cooling process and the methods that we use to solidify our parts inside the mold, but also in terms of the setting of the holding pressure that we normally use uh, or that we apply in order to compensate for uh, shrinkage. In general, um, high crystalline polymers are, as you know, characterized by um, high uh, shrinkage values or by high uh, volumetric uh, con contraction. And this contraction can lead to changes in terms of, for example, the dimensions of the parts that you are uh, injecting. Or it can also lead 
to defects like warping. So if we have regions that have a much slower cooling rate when compared to other uh, less thick regions that will solidify first and similar to what you have seen during the metal casting uh, processes, what we'll have is that in the regions where the solidification process happens at a slower rate, we'll have uh, the formation of uh, hot spots. And these hot spots will lead to shrinkage because of the differential uh, cooling, which as a consequence can result in warping of our parts, especially in long flat uh, regions of our uh, components. So it's important that uh, you know that normally this happens in uh, plastics where we have a higher crystallinity, uh, or in other words, where we have more regions with highly aligned and compact polymeric chains, and that this can cause defects like warping or changes in terms of the dimensions of your uh, parts. Another important aspect is that this doesn't happen only inside the cavity of the mold. So the solidification of your plastic components will not end um, when you open the mold and retrieve your part. Very often, the solidification process will continue after you retrieve the mold from, um, sorry, after you retrieve the part from your mold. And as a consequence, you can have additional changes um, in terms of your uh, part dimensions um, outside uh, the mold, which obviously will impact um, the functionality of your, um, of your components. And because of that, and especially in materials with a uh, high crystallinity degree, but not just in materials uh, with high crystallinity degree. In general, this is important. The control over the solidification process of our parts. And the way that we have to do that is by the use of these cooling channels that are placed uh, around our mold cavity. What these cooling channels will allow us to do is through the circulation of fluids like water at a specific temperature that we can control, it will allow us to extract heat from different regions of the mold and therefore control the solidification of our parts inside the mold. The more or the most efficient way of uh, controlling that solidification process is by using what we normally call as conformal cooling. So in conformal cooling, we make using of uh, cooling lines in an injection mold that, as you can see here in this schematic representation, curve very closely uh, to the geometry of the part that is being uh, injected. So the objective of using these conformal cooling channels is to enable the cooling of the parts in a uniform manner, reducing also the total solidification time inside the mold and improve the quality of the parts that we are uh, producing. These conformal cooling channels provide a, a tremendous advantage in mold tooling because it allows us not only to obtain parts with much higher quality uh, through the control of the solidification process, but also because it enables a significant reduction in terms of the injection uh, cycle times. So if you didn't have these cooling channels, you'd have to rely only on uh, the temperature gradients between uh, the environment where you are conducting the process and the temperature at which the material is being injected. In this way, you can overcome that and make these gradients much steeper and therefore uh, accelerate the solidification 
uh, rate. Also, and as we've seen in the previous lectures, um, these conformal cooling channels um, are normally preferred when compared to uh, conventional cooling channels that do not closely follow the geometry of the parts. By using these channels, we obviously can extract heat in a much better way, but also we can target areas in our uh, parts where we have very thick sections. And by doing that, we can uh, try and obtain a uniform uh, cooling between these uh, larger sections where the volume of material is higher when compared to thin sections where the volume is smaller and the solidification process happens uh, much faster. <coughs> In terms of uh, the process parameters that we can control using injection molding, uh, obviously one obvious parameter is uh, the melting temperature. So the melting temperature, as we've uh, said in the previous lecture, uh, is normally set in the injection cylinder just below the melting point of the plastic. And the reason why it's normally below is because we can generate additional heat by the linear and by the rotational uh, movement of the screw. So the shear forces that arise from these movements will generate heat that will compensate for uh, this difference. And as you can easily understand now, the melting temperature that we set normally in the injection cylinder to promote the melting of our plastic uh, depends highly on the structure and the morphology of our polymers. So materials with higher degrees of crystallinity, where we have um, our polymeric chains highly organized and compacted, will need much more temperature and energy to uh, break the links between these polymeric chains and to promote the melting of the material and to enable the flow of the material from the injection cylinder through the nozzle and into the cavity of the mold. Also, uh, the temperature and the controls that we have over the temperature of the mold are extremely important in terms of uh, the properties and the quality of the parts that we inject using uh, injection molding. So the mold temperature is controlled normally uh, with uh, water, but we can also use other systems. Uh, and we do that by circulating this water through uh, the channels that I've just shown you in the previous slide, but that you can also see in, uh, this, uh, in this slide, normally using conformal uh, cooling. Some factors that affect the temperatures of the system, uh, both uh, the melt temperature and the mold temperature. So the temperature that you set in the injection cylinder and the temperature that you set in the mold are normally affected by, for example, the volume of material that you are uh, injecting into the mold cavity. So obviously, if you are uh, using larger shots or larger volumes of material, these will require more temperature or energy to be melted and also to be injected into uh, the cavity of the mold. The faster uh, filling um, or the faster injection rate creates also higher uh, melting temperatures. And this is, as we've said before, the reason why we normally set the melting temperature inside the injection cylinder just below the melting temperature of the material. Also, the size of the runner system can affect um, the temperature in your, um, in your mold and also the temperature that you set on the injection cylinder. So 
the longer are your runners or the channels used to um, inject and transport the material into the mold cavity, uh, the higher are the temperatures that you require in the molds and in the uh, and in the um, in the injection cylinder. And basically, this is because if the temperature is too low, what will happen is that the material can solidify uh, within the runners and block the filling of the mold. So longer runners will require longer temperature to prevent premature freezing of your uh, plastic material. And uh, lastly, the, the, the thickness of the parts. So thick parts require more cooling time, so they will take longer to solidify and are generally molded at lower uh, temperatures. And whenever possible, when designing our parts and similar to what happens in casting processes, we would like to avoid as much as possible to have sections in our part with uh, variable uh, dimensions. So uh, try as much as possible to design parts that have homogeneous sections. Uh, if you can't do that, make sure that you have in place ways of homogenizing the solidification rate. Um, and also try as much as possible, for example, in long flat areas to have ribs that mechanically reinforce your parts and avoid warping of those areas. <clears throat> so in terms of the pressures associated with uh, the injection molding process, uh, you should always bear in mind that both the injection and holding pressure should be set at the lowest practical uh, values. And this should be done without compromising the filling of the mold. So in other words, you should always set the pressure at values that are not too high, that will require more energy. So it will increase the cost of your injection process and as a consequence, the cost of your final part. But those pressures should, should never be too low because if that happens, what you'll have is only a partial filling of the mold as what we normally call uh, uh, as a short shot. Also, the pressures should also be high enough and importantly, should be maintained long enough to minimize uh, shrinkage by adding more plastic into the mold in the process that we normally call as packing. So the injection pressure, which is the pressure that you apply to force the material initially from the injection cylinder into the mold cavity is normally lower than your packing pressure. And this packing pressure <clears throat> is applied after your injection pressure when the material is already inside the mold cavity, is already solidifying, and it's applied in order to ensure that we uh, supply the mold cavity with extra material to compensate for the shrinkage and the volumetric contraction that occurs because of the solidification process, okay? And this should be maintained uh, for um, enough time to ensure that that volume of material reaches the parts where it's needed inside the mold, fills in the gaps, completely solidifies, and then this pressure is removed. The solidification process will continue. And finally, the mold is opened and the pressure is totally relieved by retracting the uh, screw to, each, uh, to its uh, initial position. 
So in terms of these process parameters, things that you need to know, there are no calculations associated with uh, these parameters, but these are concepts that you need to know. The injection time is obviously the time to force the molten metal into uh, the uh, material, uh, into, the, the, into the cavity of the mold. And normally this uh, injection or fill rate and time is controlled by the rate at which you are injecting uh, the material. The dwell time is simply the time uh, that the packing or holding pressure is applied to your material to force um, an extra volume of material to enter the mold cavity and compensate for the shrinkage that happens during the solidification time, okay? And the freezing time or the, the cooling time is uh, normally the interval um, after the pressure is relieved by uh, retracting uh, the screw and just before the mold is uh, opened. And this time is normally um, governed by the ability of the parts to harden sufficiently to be ejected. And a way that we have to control this freeze time is by uh, controlling the temperature inside the mold with the cooling channels. Finally, the, the injection time, the, the edge ejection time uh, is basically the time that counts uh, to open the mold, to retrieve the part from the mold and for the mold to close uh, again and another, another cycle to uh, restart. Okay, so these are just some uh, important concepts that you need to know in terms of polymer processing using uh, injection uh, molding. And today, uh, as I've said before, I'd like to go through some of the most common defects in terms of injection molding, um, why these uh, defects can uh, arise, and how can we uh, try to minimize um, the frequency of these defects or eliminate them by controlling some of the process parameters that we have in injection molding. So one very common defect uh, in injection molding uh, is called sink marks. So sink marks, as you can see uh, in this uh, picture, uh, can generally be defined as uh, a depression uh, resembling a, a dimple or a groove. And this is normally caused by excessive localized shrinkage uh, of the material after the part um, has been cooled. Depressions uh, such as these ones usually form uh, over the thicker sections of, of, of the parts or hot spots, uh, if you prefer. And this is due uh, largely to the difference in cooling between uh, the thick and the thin uh, sections. And this differential cooling will generate stresses that, as we've seen and similar to metal casting, will then cause these uh, depressions by simply pulling the material and the surface towards the center. So, what are the main causes uh, for this? So obviously it's a shrinkage process, but what originates that shrinkage? So one of the main causes can be uh, insufficient polymer inside the mold cavity. One corrective action that we can uh, apply uh, during the injection process, if we verify the formation of these effects, it's by increasing the packing pressure. So if we increase the pressure that we apply after the injection of the material, what we will do is to force more material to go into the cavity of the mold. And by doing so, we will ensure that these depressions will not be formed. 
we can also, without uh, increasing the pressure, we can just extend the time that uh, the pressure is applied. And by increasing that time, we ensure that uh, the, vo the, the material has enough time to travel from the injection cylinder into um, the gaps that are formed. So sometimes it's just not a question of not having enough material. It can also be a question of not applying that pressure uh, for uh, enough time to ensure that the material uh, reaches the areas uh, that are, are uh, that have these that have these these gaps and where the shrinkage is uh, occurring. Also, if we have insufficient polymer in the mold, it might be because we are doing the injection at uh, low speed. So if we increase the injection speed, we'll decrease the likelihood of premature freezing of the material. We'll also make sure that the temperature of the material will increase. And by doing so, we also ensure that we have um, a higher fluidity of the material and as a consequence, the ability of the material to reach these areas will be higher. And um, in this way, we can minimize the formation of uh, these sink marks. Also, uh, another corrective action might be uh, to increase the dimensions of our gates, or uh, in other words, the channels that connect our runners uh, to the mold cavity. By increasing the, the size of these gates, we allow more material to get into the mold and in this way prevents uh, the formation of uh, shrinkage. Also, quite often what happens uh, when you are injecting polymeric materials, you have uh, this, this, this material flowing back out of the molds and into uh, the runner and often into the injection cylinder or uh, barrel. And if, obviously, if the material flows back, it means that we don't have enough material inside the molds. And by not having enough material, we'll have uh, more probabilities of having these sink marks. What we need to do in these cases is to, one, increase the injection hold time so that we have <clears throat> the pressure applied for longer periods of time. And in this way, we prevent the material to flow back into uh, the barrel. The other potential corrective action is to decrease the mold temperature. If the material is flowing back, often is a result of not have solidifying as quick as we would like uh, the material to solidify. So the material will be in a semi-molten state for longer periods of time, and therefore it's uh, likely that we'll travel back into injection barrel. So we need to ensure that the material, once injected, will solidify as quick as possible to prevent the flow back. So a way of doing that is by promoting a faster solidification in the mold cavity. And as we've seen, a way of doing that is by decreasing the temperature of the mold. So having water circulating in our conformal cooling channels at lower temperature, will, which will allow us to extract more heat and faster from uh, the mold cavity and therefore uh, promoting a fast solidification of your parts. The other corrective action, if you have this phenomenon of uh, flowing back, is by uh, increasing uh, the cooling time. You just basically allow the material to be for longer periods of time inside the mold um, and therefore um, promote its solidification, prevent the material flowing back. Another cause for um, this formation of sink marks is the temperature of the material being uh, too high. To prevent this, we can uh, reduce the back pressure. So the pressure that we apply 
in the injection cylinder. By reducing that back pressure, obviously we will reduce the heat that is being generated because of the shear stresses that arise because of the movements of the screw. Or we can just basically set up the temperature inside uh, the barrel uh, to be lower. Or we can improve our mold temperature controls. So we can basically uh, have, instead of having conventional cooling channels, we can have uh, conformal cooling channels. And this allows us to have a much better control over the temperature of the polymer. In this case, in the mold, but with the back pressure and uh, the barrel temperature, we have control over the temperature of the material in the injection barrel before it enters the cavity of the mold. The sink, mark, the sink marks can also be formed because basically you remove the part uh, from the mold cavity without the part being completely uh, solidified. And obviously this will generate these sink marks. So if this happens, we need to ensure that we leave the parts inside the mold for longer periods of time until solidification is completed. And in this way, we can prevent the formation of these uh, sink marks. Another very common um, defect in injection molding is the formation of these uh, uh, neat lines or uh, weld lines. These are normally visible at naked height when you extract the parts from uh, the mold cavity. And these weld lines uh, generally form whenever two molten polymer uh, flow fronts uh, meet. Problems in strength and appearance um, occur when um, there is insufficient uh, kneading or joining of these flow fronts. And this is very, very common in molds that have more than one uh, entrance into the cavity. So if you have multiple gates where you have multiple fronts of material traveling from different directions, it's very likely that if you don't have a an absolute control over the temperature and the speed at which this flow front will travel. When these multiple fronts meet, uh, it's likely that the fusion between the fronts will not occur and the formation of these weld lines um, are uh, formed. <coughs> so similar to sink lines, some of the main causes for the formation of these weld lines. One might be that you are actually injecting the material at a very low speed. So you basically, the material is traveling very slow, which means that you are allowing more material, uh, more time for the material to solidify. So when these two fronts uh, meet and collide, they will be at a temperature that it's too low and it will not enable the fusion of these two fronts and the blending of these two fronts. So we need to increase the injection speed to make sure that when these two fronts of material meet, they will be at a temperature that will allow for the complete blending and fusion of uh, the material. Another cause can be the underpacking of uh, the parts. So basically, if you also have multiple gates, if you don't apply enough pressure uh, after the, the, the injection of the material. And if, uh, if you don't apply enough pressure to force these two fronts to blend, then it's also likely that they will not uh, completely uh, melt and fuse together. So we need to increase that holding pressure to force these uh, multiple fronts to uh, fuse completely. The polymer that are uh, traveling through the runners and through the channels into the mold cavity uh, can also be at very low temperatures, or at least not at a temperature that will allow the complete fusion of the fronts. In this case, you can increase the temperature inside uh, the barrel when you are plastifying the material. 
or you can actually increase the temperature inside the mold to allow for the material to be at with higher fluidity uh, and uh, to completely blend when these fronts uh, meet. And in a similar manner, if you increase the injection speed, you will have less time for the material to solidify. And also you will increase the temperature uh, because of, as we've said before, uh, the shear stresses that are uh, formed because of the rotational and linear movements of uh, the screw. So it's always a question of controlling uh, the temperature to ensure that when the fronts meet, they are still uh, in a semi-molten state that will allow for complete for complete blending of uh, the materials. This is something that normally happens when you have uh, more than two entrances or two gates into the cavity of the mold. So if you do have that problem, you might want to consider decreasing the number of gates, obviously without compromising the complete filling of your parts. Sometimes this is not this is not possible of, of doing uh, the reduction of the number of gates because you have a very large part that has a very complex geometry and it's not possible to create the parts only one um, injection gate. So if you can't decrease the number of gates, you might want to increase uh, the size of those gates to allow for more uh, material uh, to travel and obviously at higher uh, temperatures that will allow the complete blending of the two fronts. Another possibility is just changing the locations of, um, of, these, uh, of these gates. Again, this is uh, not always possible. Um, and sometimes you uh, might not be able to change the location of uh, the gates. So the 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 most uh, common uh, corrective action is actually the decrease of the number of gates without compromising the filling of the the mold and increasing the size of uh, the gate another uh, typical defect is uh, the appearance of uh, burn marks so burn marks, as you can see uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, are normally discolorations and uh, are common uh, uh, causes of uh, part rejection. So if you have a part with a discoloration, they are normally discarded and uh, rejected. These type of effects are generally caused by trapped gases in the, cav in, in the cavity of your uh, molds, or actually by the thermal degradation of the polymer. So in other words, when, for example, the temperature at which you are processing the material is above the degradation temperature of uh, your material. And these temperatures are normally set when you buy a material, they are normally uh, provided to you. So if you're uh, buying, for example, a thermoplastic uh, material from a company, they will provide you with a sheet that gives you information about the melting temperature of the material, but also will indicate the temperature at which the material will start to be uh, degraded. And with these temperatures, you normally know what is the temperature that you need to set on your injection barrel to promote the fusion of the material and to allow for its injection without actually uh, creating these burning marks because of uh, the degradation of your uh, polymeric uh, chains. So as we've said, one of the main causes can be uh, the existence of trapped gases in the cavity of, of the mold. And similar to what we had, for example, in sand casting, we place vents inside the cavity to allow for the extraction of these gases. Sometimes these vents can be obstructed. So a simple way of trying to correct these problems is just by uh, cleaning these vents and allowing for extraction of the gases. Or it might just be the case that you don't have uh, enough uh, vents on your cavity and therefore the gases that are being formed cannot be extracted and will remain entrapped inside the material as this one uh, solidifies. But you also might want to 
decrease the injection speed. And by decreasing the injection speed, you will decrease also uh, the temperature and will also decrease the possibility of generating uh, more gases that will remain entrapped in your um, solidified parts. If the problem uh, is actually arising because of the thermal degradation of your polymer and it's not caused by any gases that are entrapped in your material, then a way of avoiding that thermal degradation is by decreasing the injection speed. And this allows us to decrease the temperatures at which we are injecting the material. Or you might just want to decrease the melting temperature. Sometimes the melting temperature might just be too high or too close to the degradation temperature. And by the linear and rotational movement of the screw, you are creating even further heat that will then cause the thermal degradation of your uh, material. Finally, uh, a very typical uh, defect in uh, injection molding is uh, what we call a short uh, shot or uh, incomplete filling of your uh, mold cavity. So basically this happens uh, when you are trying to inject a part and when you open the mold, you realize that um, not all or the entirety of the cavity of the mold has been filled with uh, material. This can happen if the temperature is not adequate, uh, the temperature, for example, in the injection cylinder, if the temperature is too low, uh, this means that the material will probably freeze uh, in the runners or in the nozzle or in the injection cylinder. And therefore, you will not have enough material uh, traveling into the mold and filling in uh, uh, the cavity. The other reason might be related with the pressures that you are setting in your process. So if the pressure, the injection pressure is too low, you will not have enough forces to push the material into the cavity of the mold, or at least into all of the regions of the cavity of the mold, and therefore they will not be completely filled. But also the packing pressure might not be sufficient. So uh, in regions where you already have material, you're not gonna be able to force extra material to pass through those regions and reach these areas um, where the material is lacking. Another important thing that you need to bear in mind uh, if these uh, short shots happen is uh, the injection speed. If this injection speed uh, is too slow, the plastic may freeze uh, before it actually reaches the cavity or at least all of the cavities of the mold. So the control over the injection speed is also important to avoid these short shots. And obviously the temperature inside uh, the mold. So if this happens when you are injecting a part, so if you're realizing that you have incomplete filling of the mold, but your melt temperature, your pressure, your injection speed is adequate, then one way that you have to prevent these short uh, shots is by increasing uh, the temperature inside the mold. And you can do this by increasing the temperature of the fluid they have traveling in your conformal uh, cooling channels. And by doing that, by increasing the temperature, you will maintain the material in a molten state for enough time in order for that material to completely fill in uh, the mold's cavity. So these are some of the most common defects. There are much more defects, but these are the most common defects in injection molding. And uh, also some of the most common uh, corrective actions that you can apply during the injection of plastics to avoid um, the formation of these uh, defects. So just uh, to summarize today's lectures, uh, sink marks are normally caused by uh, shrinkage. Uh, shrinkage, as you know, happen during the solidification process of uh, the material. So it's a volumetric contraction because of the rearrangements of the polymeric chains during the solidification uh, process. This, uh, these sink marks can be uh, 
form because we don't have enough material in the molds or because uh, the material is simply flowing back from the mold into the injection cylinder uh, or because of the temperatures that we are using in the injection barrel and in the mold are simply too high and the material uh, has a very high fluidity and therefore is allowed to travel back into uh, the barrel or it also happens because we inject we eject the part from the mold when it's still uh, hot and there are several corrective actions that we can apply to uh, minimize or mitigate these defects the weld lines happen normally when you have uh, multiple uh, gates and the most common reason is because we don't have enough temperature at these different front lines to uh, allow for the blending of the of the materials and therefore avoid the formation of the weld lines burn marks are normally related with existence of trapped gases that can also um, be generated because the temperatures that we're using to melt the material are above the degradation temperature of your uh, polymer. Okay, and this brings us to the end of our lecture. And um, as usual, I'm happy to answer any questions you uh, have.